Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. My grandmother of blessed memory was the only grandparent I was blessed to know. All my other three grandparents had died before I was born. Her name was Leah Wolin, and she was an immigrant from Riga, Latvia, who grew up in a very traditional home, who then emigrated through London, Ontario to Flint, Michigan. Now today, Flint is in the news for all types of bad things, but in the 30s and 40s and 50s, Flint was a pretty hopping place to be. It was the center of industry, the car industry, and she met a man who also was from former Russia and got married and had five amazing children, and she lived very much the American dream. But that American dream was always influenced by who she was and how she was raised, what her parents and grandparents had to go through. And I remember being her youngest, get this, her youngest of 13 grandchildren, Rebecca, and sitting at my kitchen table in Detroit where I grew up and saying to her, Bubby, I've got some great news. I'm going next year to Israel for my freshman year of college and I'm gonna study in Israel for the year. And my grandmother didn't respond. She just got this look in her face and her eyes welled up with tears. She had been to Israel two times, but she got very emotional. And I had seen that look in her eyes a couple times before. I saw it on Passover every time we celebrated the Seder together. And I saw it on Yom Kippur whenever we got to Ne'ilah. You see, on Passover and on Yom Kippur, we say this phrase, and it's become routine for us. The cantor sings it beautifully. We say, Lishana haba Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. And for us, that's a phrase we've been singing our whole lives, and it's a lovely phrase. And it's this idea of a hopeful idea notion that next year we'll go to Jerusalem. But for my grandmother, who remembers as a child having to whisper the Passover Seder because there were drunk Cossacks outside looking to do harm to Jewish people, or my grandmother who remembers the town butcher who also had the avocation of leading on the high holidays and singing during the Elah when we would close Yom Kippur L'Shana Habab Yerushalayim in the 20s and the 30s, that these were mere messianic words. It was the same idea taken out of the spiritual realm as one day saying a man will land and walk on the moon. It was far-fetched, was unbelievable, but she said it still in the hopes of redemption and messianism. And she believed it. So when I told her I'd be spending the year in Israel studying in 1990, I saw that same look on her face, like that dream, that hope, that messianic belief was now coming to fruition, and it was in her lifetime, and she couldn't believe it. And I imagine, I imagine that on July the 20th, when Neil Armstrong took that first step for mankind and that giant leap for humanity, that there was a very similar feeling for people, that there were human beings walking on the moon in our lifetime, and we just couldn't believe it. Now, I share that story with my grandmother today because I am still reverberating and reeling in a positive way from one of the most life-changing experiences that I have ever had. I just came back over a week ago from an amazing trip to Abu Dhabi, Bahrain, and Dubai. And the purpose of the trip with 25 members from our community and congregation was to taste the fruits of the Abraham Accords. And we did just that. Now, every single Shabbat, since I was a little boy, we made a prayer for peace, a prayer for Israel, 
a prayer that the enemies of our country would come together in unification. And I felt like my grandmother, that it was happening in front of my eyes. That what seemed like this messianic hope, far-fetched, unreachable, and unachievable, really was taking place. And I want to share three very brief vignettes of what happened over in the Middle East in our Gulf Coast countries that I think are emblematic of what that fruit of the Abraham Accords tastes like, and equally important, what it is to live through a time when miracles come to fruition. By pure mazel, pure luck, our trip started on a fortuitous day. It was Sunday, and it was the day of the opening of the Ben Maimon Synagogue in Abu Dhabi. Sounds really great, but the Ben Maimon Synagogue is more than just something that's really great. The Ben Maimon Synagogue is a synagogue placed in the middle of an Abrahamic center, where there is a synagogue, a church, and a mosque, all on the same premises, all built by the Emirati government. Each of the three buildings are exactly the same square footage, but the designs, entrances, and accoutrements are unique to the way that each of the faiths pray. And on top of the buildings together, there is a shared garden that all three of these prayer facilities unite for and have in common. There are offices for all of the prayer spaces, and together, it is a place where all of the Abrahamic religions can be a part of. It was built and designed by a world-famous architect, Sir David Nage, who um, is from Ghana, who did a magnificent job incorporating so many parts and historical meanings from each of the religions. So we were there for the opening and we'd say, oh, that's very fortuitous, except for this. It's the first time a synagogue has opened in a Muslim country or an Arab land in 100 years. The first time. And we happened to be there the day it was opening. A hundred years. Because before that, before the state of Israel, Jews lived in all types of Arab countries. We lived in Iran, we lived in Iraq, we lived in Morocco, we lived in Egypt. But since the state of Israel, all of those Jews were forced out. So to see this opening was an amazing sight. And, and, as if all that's not enough, to know that the synagogue was funded by the government of the United Arab Emirates was a really powerful statement of their commitment to this multi-faith endeavor. For me, what, what caught my attention was an Arab Jew, a Jew who was persecuted in Yemen, who miraculously escaped from Yemen through the help of the United Arab Emirates, who dresses in full Arab garb with a jalabi, no kafiyah, he wore a yarmulke, and he offered a prayer, an invocation that is said every Shabbat now at the Ben Maimon Synagogue, a prayer for the King of the United Arab Emirates, Sheikh Mohammed Ben Zayed. And he said it in Arabic. So there we were in a Muslim country, in an Arab land, with a Yemenite Jew who was persecuted in Yemen and escaped to the Emirates, offering a prayer for the king of the United Arab Emirates in Arabic, and everyone responding, Amen. I felt like my grandmother. I felt like I was witnessing a miracle. Vignette number two. We made our way to Bahrain. For those of you who don't know the history of oil, Bahrain was the first Gulf Coast country to discover oil in 1931. It basically is also the first Gulf Coast country to run out of oil. Most recently, they have very little oil left. It's a very, very small country with just over a million inhabitants, and it's about the size of the Gaza Strip, just a touch bigger. And beautiful people are in Bahrain. We were staying at a lovely hotel, which just by happenstance, the president of Turkmenistan, which for those of you kids who watch Borat is near Kazakhstan, the president of Turkmenistan was staying at our hotel as well. 
which meant there was a lot of security, Secret Service, his limo was outside, he was actually staying in one of the rooms on one of the floors with some of the people from our trip. And outside, as we were getting ready to leave this hotel, there were five men wearing keffiyeh and jalabi sitting outside having a smoke. And I thought this would make a nice picture. So I walk over to them. As I walk over to them, a security guard kind of intervenes and realizes I'm not posing much of a threat. And I start to talk to them for a minute and wanted to get a picture. And what I realized was these men were part of Bahraini leadership. They were part of the most royal leadership in the country. Because the way it worked back then in 1931 was basically a Muslim Arabic form of Jed Clampett. They owned all of this different land out in the fields. They were Bedouins and sand, and then they realized there was oil underneath, and they all became incredibly wealthy billionaires and beyond. But they were at their core Bedouin Arab Muslims. And they were all outside the hotel because you can't smoke inside the hotel, and they were taking a smoke break in the morning. And I went up to them and I said, my name is David Kirshner. I'm from New Jersey, but I'm representing Israel and America and the ties, and we're here to celebrate the Abraham Accords. And you could tell all of these people in their royalty and leadership, I actually have a beautiful picture of it in my office. They all shook my hand with honor. And the leader came to me and said, we are so glad you are here representing Israel and America. And we hope that you bring many investments to Bahrain and we can increase trade. However, however, more important than investments in trade, we hope you continue to bring peace because that's what we seek most from Israel, America, and all of our neighbors. And I think all of you can appreciate that when people say things that are authentic, real, true, you sometimes just feel it. It kind of enters, my grandmother would say, your kishkas, your, your bones, you know it. And I felt it. They meant it. They wanted us to bring trade and investment, of course, which country doesn't? But more than that, they were celebrating and hoping to keep in perpetuity the peace that has begun to really blossom. That really was the bud of the beginning of the Abraham Accords. And to see that from the most royal and established leadership of this country, which owns the history of oil, was very, very meaningful and powerful for all of us. The last story I'll share with you is from the synagogue in Dubai. And there we met with a gentleman by the name of Ross Creel, who was the organizer of the community. He's not a rabbi, but he organizes the Jewish community. And what he realized is way before the Abraham Accords, he was living in Dubai and he found a handful of other Jews who were doing work there because it began a lot of trade in the late 80s, early 90s, and then the turn of the century as well. And he found enough people for a minion and he said, we need to find a place where we can daven every Shabbat. So they rented a villa on the beach and they rented it from a very devout, very successful real estate mogul who lived in Dubai, who of course was Muslim. And they refused to tell him what they were renting the villa for. And as they all came and met, they closed all the shades. Someone would knock at the door, they'd be afraid. They created a secret knock because if they found out that there were Jews praying, they worried for their safety and their well-being. Well, Ross had a major problem keeping this facade and this lie from the person he was renting the villa from. And after two years, it came time to renew the lease. And he said, I can't keep this lie anymore. I have to tell this person who's involved now in the government and who owns all of this real estate what it is we're using the villa for. So he met with him to renew the lease and he said, you should know your excellency that this villa that we are renting is used by Jews to pray every week. I can't keep the lie from you anymore. And the man's tears formed in his eyes and trickled down and he said, that is the most beautiful gift you could give me in this sacred property. He donated most of the proceeds from that time forward and the synagogue began to grow and blossom. They opened up the shades and the doors. There were no longer a secret knock. And now, even at times like then, and the Shabbat we were there, 
we welcomed in a Shiite cleric from Scotland to offer the Devar Torah on Shabbat. That's the level of tolerance, acceptance, and pluralism that is rampant in Dubai and the Emirates. And it was one of these moments that touched my heart and stirred my heart. And throughout that entire trip, and I have been quite nostalgic and spiritual lately for the obvious reasons, I felt my bubby, my grandmother, with her hand on my shoulder. She has long since left this world, but I just felt her presence, and I felt that exact same feeling that she couldn't articulate in words, but I could sense when we said next year in Jerusalem, and that she was witnessing it in her lifetime, that she was part of a 2,000-year-old tradition, that she got to see that transition between what was forbidden and what became a reality. And that here I was in my lifetime, a young boy who came to shul every week, and then a man who chooses a career in the rabbinate and Judaism, who says a prayer for peace over and over and over. And to me, that prayer felt like, like electric cars or vehicles that we could all personally take that fly, like it was science fiction, was unattainable. And here it was, in reality, tasting the fruits of that very, very dream. Theodore Herzl once said, if you will it, it is no dream. If we make it possible, it is no miracle. To see those miracles in our lifetime, to know that 25% of the cars in our parking lot are probably electric today, and soon there will be vehicles that can transport themselves over the air, that we will all live and witness these things. But if we can't appreciate them, if we can't absorb that miracle in our lifetime, then it all washes right by us. I hope all of us can put on lenses over our eyes that refract the noise and allow us to see the beauty that surrounds us, the miracles that come to fruition, and our role in helping those miracles get fertilized, tilled, watered, and be part of its blossoming so that its fruits will be sweet for us and for generations to come. Kenya Hiratsom, may that be God's will. Amen.